Hello, my name is Russell Trepper-Jones and this is Broadcast Focus, a channel where we talk to the people behind the media industry about things which are important, interesting and compelling. And this time I'm going to be talking to Polly Hickling, who has spent many years teaching at Solent University in the past. And the reason we spoke is because uh, we spoke to Susan Pratt of the University of Surrey a few weeks ago on the channel. Now, in that conversation, we were talking about bringing people into university courses. But with Polly, we decided to touch on how to get into schools to at least light a small spark of interest and awareness of the media industry with pupils of many different ages. Now, before I pass over to past Russell, I'll just suddenly say that it'd be really great for you to like and subscribe. And now passing over to past Russell, who had to deal with a fair number of technical problems while he was traveling over the Christmas break. Well, it's over to you. Hi, Polly. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me back. One topic that we have discussed before, what's the best age to um, to actually, if we're talking about approaching school children and suggesting that, in case you didn't know, these jobs that exist, you know, behind the camera, there's actually interesting stuff. You don't just have to hold a camera. You know, how young is, is too young? <clears throat> well, I think it's one of those ones that will be answered differently depending on who you're asking. Um, I've been part of panels before where that question has been asked to industry when I was in academia um, and industry would say, well, we want them, we want to be telling them this information when they're just about to enter because um, we need people as quickly as possible. You know, we've got skill shortage, et cetera, um, mm. <clears throat> which is fine, but kind of evidence shows that really it's kind of seven upwards that we start I mean we're always asking kids what they want to be when they grow up um, I'm guilty of doing this with my own children I try not to but apparently from the kind of age of seven up we're, we're actually getting them to really think about what they might want to be which I think is slightly terrifying um, but we know that it's there is an question. issue uh, yeah absolutely but, you know um, and we love so to imagine not, what they're going to be when they grow up yeah. Yeah. Well, once um, they, the question is, once they've got past the the idea of answering astronaut or whatever, um, <laughs> yeah. which I'm not dismissing, but there are only a certain number of astronauts, then they're going to form, start forming a <clears throat> another view of something else they might want to be. And then at some point, everybody's different. At some point, that kind of starts actually being the basis of, I guess, their, their preferences going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and but the reality that we know is that the kind of 14 year olds who are who are genuinely starting to um, choose subjects related to the career that they want don't actually know about the careers in our industry and that's probably one of the biggest issues that we face with recruiting so if we're going to accept that six or seven is a good age mm -hmm. to start that conversation it feels like we're kind of we're going to have to keep on revisiting that topic I'm, i can imagine somebody saying well i remember someone coming in and i was seven years old and they said this and they changed my you know that's not going to happen every time is it so now back do we then have to revisit those same people after two you know two years later three years or do we pop in at 14 just before they choose their gcses i think it's about planting the seeds isn't it i mean if you think about how um education around coding and things has changed in the last 10 years when you've got your six or seven year old being introduced to coding they're not suddenly I mean correct me if I'm wrong because I don't teach primary but I'm pretty sure they're not getting a raspberry pi out and setting up some sensors and doing that kind of thing at that age they're just planting the seed of the building blocks of coding um, and the purpose yep. of that we, as we know has been to filter into our industry because we need more people doing those kind of roles so i think it's yeah. it's planting the seed and then following that on with progressive scaffolded activities yeah well the i mean the basis of the it education is, is computational thinking which is ideal because it's exactly the same type of thinking that we need when we're trying to solve um the problems it's just then you know it's just assumed that you're going to move on and do something which is more computery and um and not media based so it's all very well thinking about um how we go into the school or what we might say when we're there um, what do you think is the key to actually having that 
having that opportunity how do you talk to schools well i think as susan kind of mentioned there's there's opportunities when i worked in academia to be going in as part of outreach um, as part of organized days um and you know universities are very good at that they have whole teams to support doing that <clears throat> But even then, I did find I wasn't necessarily in front of the right groups of people. So I may have only been hitting one or two people that may have come to join the course in, in a few years time. Um, I think at, at this stage where we are facing such an issue with with getting people in, um, the onus needs to start to be on on industry to look at those opportunities. And I understand that not every company is going to have someone who's going to engage with outreach. I'm really lucky at Everton, we actually have um, people specifically within that role that look at outreach and how we do that. Um, and there are some really clever ways that, that we've started to engage with that. But again, it's going to depend on the, the size of the company, how much resources they have to kind of put into these things. But I think there are ways that we can work around this and we can be a bit clever about it. We just need to be thinking about it. And, and there are methods for, for actually doing this. Is there is there an element where we need to be talking to the teachers instead of the children or does it suffice just to try and get in front of the children? I think that there's a slight issue in that careers advisors and teachers also don't know what we do. <clears throat> why, why would they necessarily? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> let's face it, a lot sure. of what we do is very niche and lots of acronyms. So it's not particularly accessible from the outside. Um, so, yes, I do yep. think there is a need for us to be talking more about what we do to people um, so that that boundary is broken down um, where we're not having to explain what it is that we do and then say this is what we're going to come in and talk about or an activity. Because I, I personally think that some hands on activities are the best things to actually be doing. Um, yeah, but, you know, that is a boundary that that does need to be overcome. Perhaps we need to get the teachers doing those same activities as, as the children, because if we can yeah. get them. And, uh, and I know that particularly you know, the Rise Summer School, it's not just the kids that enjoy the activities. <laughs> it's the adults that, uh, <laughs> that do it, too. And not just the, uh, you know, the adults that are coming in from outside. It's the it's sure. the, the members of industry doing something slightly different that they don't do every day. Mm -hmm. So. So, yeah. I think so. So you mentioned at the Rise Up Academy, that's you know, that's a good example of something which is really motivational. So all of the children there are cared for at the school and brought brought around into different activities by volunteers. And those volunteers come from around uh, industry. The best thing there is, as you say, people are getting hands on and whether it's color grading or it's um, doing a bit of Python or making a um, TV program that's going to stick with you in, in a very significant way. The the summer school came about because there were workshops that were going on throughout the year. Um, and, and the summer school was a great way to mm. kind of bring that all together. Um, so there was sort of a, a standard template of workshops that were delivered throughout the year. Um, but absolutely that um, delivery, that hands-on experience, um, and particularly in the holidays, um, was well is phenomenal amazing organization by everybody involved hosted at global academy which is a, a an absolutely fantastic facility um, really able to showcase once once you're at a certain age and you can specialize you can yeah. study in this you know this great place these very niche and specific things so yeah i mean it's 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 wonderful um, and it's seeing yeah. i think something like 500 students were coming through that um, which is a, an amazing mm -hmm. number um, but we're still you know we're, we're still needing to reach more so it, I think we also need to think about um, what, what else we can do how else we can yeah. support support rise um, and and their workshops and work um, but what what individually um, and within our own companies we can be doing as well so I think the issue with um, you know that the Rise Up Academy faces is you know how do you scale up and really you know we need to reach the whole of the UK. It's really difficult to do that financially, logistically. So I think what you're trying to say is let, let's let's do that as much as we can. But then the, there are other ways you know, of, of doing outreach. So one of them going and 
finding as many careers advisors as you can find <laughs> and talking yep. to them and making sure that they understand that there are options. And I think that, that really goes back to what, what Susan was saying. If you want to do something, then the best thing you can do is go yourself to a school, have a word um, with them and either agree to go and explain what you get up to um, or and then talk to the careers advisor. And so that's, that's a kind of a small, low-level way, which hopefully is a bit more scalable at, at touching that. What, what other kind of ways do you think there are? Because you're talking about industry taking action. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm very cautious about saying this because I know it's been a tough year for many companies. There's been redundancies and mergers and, um, you know, difficult times. So I'm I'm fully aware that this probably isn't the top of a lot of um, a lot of people's priorities, but it kind of hasn't been top of a lot of people's priorities for quite a while now. And we find ourselves in this situation where we're struggling to to employ. So at some point we have to push it up there um, and, and my kind yep. of suggestion would be if we're going to do that then um, we need to think cleverly about how we can um, engage with with uh, schools and um, students across the board because don't forget you know our previous conversation was about diversity um, so if we're only doing kind of stem outreach which I love absolutely love the engagement with the STEM and um, obviously me and you sitting on the IET as well we're very much for that um, we're probably missing a pool of people though who actually would want to come and work in our, our industry but aren't hearing about it so I think um, there's some clever ways that we can do it probably by pooling resources between our companies as well you know we're all working together anyway it's not a very big industry um, how about we collaboratively well, collaboratively deliver some of these things, um, which is kind of what I'm planning to do in February, actually, um, with a with a hackathon. So that's with Eviden and other partners. Yeah. So foolishly, I uh, did the Three Peaks Challenge back in September. I think I've maybe just about recovered now. Don't recommend doing that. If I recall um, that that was just before IBC, which was a bold was choice. Yeah, it was a few. It was the weekend before IBC, so I literally came back, having not slept, and walked mountains, and then uh, got on a plane a few days later to IBC, doing you know your twenty thousand steps a day IBC and your heavy drinking. Um, so yeah, that was fun. Um, <clears throat> but the the point was that I I did that and managed gratefully to everybody who contributed to raise £1,300 specifically to deliver this this event that we're going to do because I I you know I am aware that these things do cost money both in the time that people are engaging with them but also in making them something worthwhile delivering um, so I was very fortunate that um, I raised that money that was um, under my head of education hat for women in streaming media so it's it's a women in streaming media event it will be hosted at Everton and and very heavily supported by my lovely outreach teams at Everton um, we're also going to be delivering so a couple of activities um, the first one supported by AWS um, who Chris also mm -hmm. did three peaks with me um, and the second nice. one will be supported by Bruce Devlin from uh, with with his Metarex uh, project, um, and we're working with Next Tech Girls who will uh, who who are uh, signing up the schools for the event. So it's a real kind of collaborative approach, um, and and will be supported by women in streaming media as well for keynotes. Um, and mm -hmm. um, so the the point is to kind of showcase to people studying computer science, so we're targeting 16, um, 16, 17 year olds, that they can come and work in the media using their skills that they're learning to the kind of application of, of media. Um, okay. So, you know, obviously I'm not suggesting everybody goes and does the Three Peaks Challenge. I'm not sure I'd recommend that to many people. Um, <laughs> but just kind of thinking outside of the box about how we can deliver these things is my mm -hmm. suggestion. The idea of getting together three or four organizations that have got a similar need presumably you think that that could be used whether it's to try and kind of get people in who are already in another industry 
as much as targeting science or you know, physics or some other parts of the education system. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, um, I was talking recently uh, with um, a lady that runs uh, a kind of awareness. Uh, it's not really a podcast. It's just like a, a series of talks um, from Evident as well. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and she says primarily it's for people that want to move around and work in different parts of the company and to be aware that, that you know, these are the other parts still doing similar potentially roles, um, but in, in different areas. So, so yeah, I think there's a kind of need for that as well. Um, that, that conversion from other places probably takes a little bit more work. Um, so maybe some more thoughts around that, but yeah, I think having a sort of template for being able to deliver activities would be really, really helpful and definitely a collaborative approach. And I think it's it's important, you know, we talk about the kind of program making activities that we can get students to do. They are so fun and I absolutely love delivering that that workshop for for the um, summer school. Um, but they're also kind of easy to see the roles. Um, you've got a massive OB truck it's fantastic isn't it it's, it, mm. it it's great but some of us working in some of those companies that maybe uh develop products or even harder now we're just developing software and things um joining up with other people so you can see that chain that broadcast chain is probably really useful um for kind of getting people's understanding of of what we do yeah i, I often <clears throat> use the example of a like media asset management engineer someone who's you know, has to keep it working put it together you know how do you explain that all of these files need to be in place and it's not just you can't just shove them in the cloud so having a mixture of the activities though also allows you to kind of bring people in <clears throat> under one banner but help expand their view of what's possible and and i like the idea of the collaboration angle because it can be quite tricky for smaller companies to have somebody who's always trying to do outreach and things like that but if you can then combine a larger company that has a little bit of that and then you can offer your your people your time your ideas it allows you to be part of that without you know the, the difficulties and whether it's a someone who's absolutely massive like aws or sky or whatever it feels like a, a sustainable way financially speaking of actually doing the outreach yeah absolutely and i think um you know because sometimes the sticking points could be something as simple as simple as having space um being able mm -hmm. to feed people <clears throat> um you know a bit of swag and and those <laughs> can almost quite quickly be solved uh by utilizing some of those those bigger companies as well and, and i also think it's really important and this is what rise up was great at doing um was delivering those workshops across the country so they did some amazing ones um mm -hmm. up in liverpool really targeting some of those areas that probably wouldn't have seen this stuff otherwise so i think that's really yeah. important that we kind of um uh, engage with that as well so that we're not because it's very easy especially when all of our companies are based in London just to reach out to the to the local London schools and you know I'm not suggesting that I'm not doing that with this hackathon because that's kind of what I'm doing but <laughs> got to start somewhere um, and again developing those yep. kind of templates um, particularly with, where we've got companies some of those bigger companies based in other locations around the UK um, I could see it could become easier if we um, have some kind of I'm not suggesting we standardize it. I did nearly say that. <laughs> if it's some more standard methods <laughs> of delivering these things. That's good. You know, it was really interesting. So thanks, Polly, for, for sharing that. As you say, we've just got to keep thinking of, of more ideas. If we keep on adding another idea and, and scaling that up, and before we know it, we'll actually have a sizable engagement. And um, the best time to start is now. Um, you know, it has to be a longer burn. It has to be a long-term project. Uh, particularly if you're dying with seven-year-olds but um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um thanks for sharing that thanks for having me